you know, yesterday I, I always kind of began with, okay, God, what do you want me to pray? You know, and sometimes it's just, and, and I'll say this, he wants me to pray for me. <laughs> but, you know, most of the time it's he, he, he's wanting me to pray for you guys. And so this time it was kind of a combo thing. So it was me and you. I was praying for a lot yesterday, but this is just what he gave me. And it started with, help me, help us live in joy. Having joy in the little things. To have joy in the day today routines, to have joy in the quiet times, to have joy in what seems to be inconveniences, to have joy when I am tired, to have joy when people aren't treating me right, to have joy in the have to do lists, and to have joy in the I don't want to do lists. My happiness is the joy of the Lord. And a couple of scriptures that I want to give you, and that's Acts 2, 28. You have made known to me the way of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. And in Acts 20, 24, that we all finish our course, all of our courses, with joy. And ending in Romans 15, 13, now the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace and here's the key in believing you must believe that he's this good you must it's a must but anyway that's what i prayed for you guys yesterday amen that's good isn't it great to be a part of a happy church amen. of a joy-filled church all right, well, let's, uh, let's get into a whole new series today. I'm so excited about this. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to, to, con to, to get to this point. Um, I thought what I would do is call it the word of the kingdom. And so that's kind of the general direction that we're going to go because God has placed on my heart uh, what it means to live in the kingdom. But I really think that I'm going to actually rephrase this series and, and name it Living the Changed Life living the changed life because Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Jesus came so that we wouldn't have to live like the rest of the world. Jesus came to restore lost dominion to humanity. Praise God. Jesus came so that we might just experience everlasting life that begins right now here in the earth and, and, and he changed us. It's not that we, we're going to become changed. He changed us. He did everything. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. But what does it mean to live the changed life? How do you live that life? How do you experience that life? It's one thing to say, I believe that Jesus did this and that, that, that he's that good and God's good and thank God for everything that he's done. Thank God for his grace. But if it's not producing a real experience in our life, a real change in our life, a real uh, 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 union with God, if you will, that people see that change, then, then, then maybe we've missed something along the way. Amen. So today we're going to start looking at living the changed life. And I really believe that if you'll stick with me through this series, that by the end of it, that you're going, you're going to see some things, you're going to experience some things, you're going to make some decisions that is going to have profound effect on your daily living. Amen. And for what God wants to do and, ex and so that you'll experience him in his life. Praise God. So let's start out at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and let's just look at verse 1. What we want to do is start at the beginning. Somebody says, well, Genesis is the beginning. No, John chapter 1 is the beginning. Because it says, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So at the very beginning, before anything was created, before anything came into existence, was the Word. Now, you've got to renew your mind. You've got to think about this. You've got to see the Word of God 
was before any of this physical universe even created. And so it says that the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now look at the next verse. All things were made by Him. Well, okay, so it says, he went to verse 3. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Let that sink in for a moment. Without the word, nothing was created that exists today. The very beginning, you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that God said, light be. And light had no choice but to come into existence. God said, let the dry earth appear. God said, and you see all through Genesis chapter 1, God said. It says God said, and then God saw. God said, and then it came into being, and God saw that it was good. Everything that, the, whew, everything that God speaks has creative power in it to cause to come to pass that which is spoken and it is always good. Always good. And when he finished creation, God saw and it was very good. And that's what God wants to exist in our lives, that everything that happens comes as a result of the word and that what we see in our life is very good because God, is very good. And he created man to have dominion and to reign over this creation. Praise God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made. Now again, without him, God, true, but without the word. Without the word was not anything made. Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. That means, every, that means that seat that you're sitting on right now is being held together by the decree of God, by the word of God that was spoken thousands of years ago. This universe is held together by the word of God. Now, I want to I want to quote a verse and I want you to think about it for a moment as we I, I'm going to lay this out little bit by little bit. OK, I, I, and, and, you know, we we here we are word people. But what I want you to I want, what I want you to get an understanding of today, what I want you to really pay attention to is it's one thing to talk about God's word and what he did. But it's another thing for you to make a decision to let your life be governed by that word. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus came. Yes, sir. Jesus came. Jesus, full of grace and truth, came so that we would no longer be enslaved to darkness, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, so that we would no longer be enslaved to the devil so that we would no longer be enslaved to the course of this world and to the curse of the law, that we would not have to experience that. Jesus came to lift us out of that, to move us, the Bible says in Colossians 1.13, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, to put us into a different kingdom. Man, I, there's so many things that I, I, I know where we're going. He, he, he did that so that we can, we can begin to live our lives living a changed life. He changed us so that we could live that changed life being governed by the word of the kingdom. Amen. By the word of the kingdom. All things are held and supported by the word of his power. Look at verse 14 here in John chapter 1. Talking about Jesus coming into the flesh. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word, somebody say the word. the word. And the Word was made flesh. The Word of God, whoo, was made flesh. And just 
happened into this physical, natural universe in the form of a human person by the name of Jesus. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Word of God. That's the living Word of God in action. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The Word of God is alive. It's a, li- it's a life-giving entity. It's a life-giving uh, 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 spirit. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I mean, it goes right to the dividing line. It goes on to say between your soul and to your spirit. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of, of the heart. I'm telling you that if it, you can go to as many, uh, you can get as many degrees Go to any university, try to get as much education as you want, but you'll never come close to tapping the resources that is in the Word of God, that is in the kingdom of God. Man tries to educate through man's human reasoning and through what man has learned. But I'm telling you, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the base things of the world. He's chosen things that the world says makes no sense, that you shouldn't do it this way. But God's got wisdom that that no man can understand. His wisdom, His Word goes beyond our natural understanding. And if I want to start living the changed life, I need to have my life governed by that word. I got to go straight to the source, praise God. Mm. Glory to God. We're just getting warmed up. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. This is why I'm calling it kind of the word of the kingdom. I want you to see this. Now, we've got we've to lay this out. You got to see this very clearly. In Matthew chapter, uh, again, um, 13 verse, what did I say? Uh, Yeah, 13 verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom. Now here he's talking about the parable of the sower, and we're going to look at that here in just a few moments. But when anyone hears, and, and, and Jesus calls it the word of the kingdom. Well, what kingdom? His kingdom, obviously. But let's talk about kingdom for a minute because we live, in a, we live in a republic or we live in a democracy. We're used to everybody voting on everything. We, we're used to trying to get our own way. We're, you know, now our, our, our society has, has, is getting to where now if you don't like it, you protest. If you don't like it, you, you, you throw a tantrum. If you don't like it, you know, so, so we're all about getting our own way and it don't work that way in the kingdom. In the kingdom, it's about what the king decrees. In the kingdom, it's about the word that comes from the king. It is a dictatorship where the word, whatever he said, it goes. And that's the way it is. You, 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 don't, get to, you don't get to rebel. I mean, you can if you want to, but if you do, you reap the consequences of it sometimes. So what kingdom? And why is this important? Well, first of all, the kingdom of God existed. I want you to get this. The kingdom of God existed before Jesus came to the earth. We're talking about kingdom, but this is so important because we think about a kingdom that began when Jesus came to the earth. And we've talked about the beginning of of his earthly kingdom, if you will. But the kingdom of God actually has always existed. In Psalm chapter 145, verse 13. Let's pull that up. Psalm 145, verse 13. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 145, 13 says, Your kingdom, now this is before Jesus came. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom And your dominion endures throughout all generations. Your kingdom is is an everlasting kingdom. This is what the psalmist is saying to God. And then there's another scripture. Let me see if I can find it here in my notes. I just love this. Um, It talks about this. Psalm 119 verse 89. Let's pull that up. Because we got to kind of lay this foundation for a moment. Psalm 119 verse 89. Psalm 
I want you to see it. I did not give them notes ahead of time, so they're just pulling it up. Psalm 119, verse 89. And here it comes. Three. <laughs> Two, there it is. Forever, O oh Lord. Somebody say forever. Forever. Your word is settled in heaven. Forever your word is settled in heaven. Notice that it does not say that forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven and in earth. It says it's settled in heaven. This is important. Because God gave dominion in the earthly realm to man. And this is the reason why Jesus had to come. This is the reason why the Word had to become flesh. So that the Word, as it became flesh, would begin to make things right again, would begin to establish the dominion. Get it? The dominion of heaven would be brought to earth. What God had forever decreed and settled in heaven would be, begin to be decreed and settled in your life would be uh, decreed and settled in the earth. That as we take our place as rightful heirs of God, as joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that all of a sudden we have authority that has been regained. We have dominion that has been restored and that now the word that has been forever decreed and settled in heaven would now begin to operate in my life and as I decree it will be forever settled in my life. What I was, see, this is a spiritual kingdom. This is not a physical kingdom here in the earth. That's where the Jewish people missed it. They thought that Jesus was going to come and establish a throne in Jerusalem. That's not what he came for. When uh, right there in the middle of the Roman Empire, uh, John the Baptist burst on the scene saying, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Jesus, as he began his ministry, the kingdom of heaven, see, the, what, what I say, the, the word of God is forever settled in heaven. It's a spiritual kingdom. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth and that heaven would live on the inside of us. Man, I'm getting so excited about this. Uh, I'm doing really good just to stay pretty still right now. The kingdom of heaven. And so, and so that's the good news. It's an invitation. He says, repent, change your way of thinking. Change your mind. Stop going according to the way everybody else lives. Stop living like that. Stop, stop living under sin. Stop living under addiction. Stop it. I have now, through grace and truth, empowered you to be able to live free from that, to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of heaven to enjoy joy forevermore, to enjoy peace in your life, to enjoy success, to enjoy healing, to experience the love of God, to experience self-control, to experience all of the fruit of the Spirit. All of that has been made available because of the Word becoming flesh and the kingdom of heaven coming into earth. Amen. He sent the disciples out. He said, when you go, preach, repent. For the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus' focus was about that, was about the rule of law, if you will, the, which is the love of God, that rule, that heaven would rule. What did he pray? He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. I mean, yeah, on earth as it is in heaven. That very, that word that, that as it was decreed, settled in heaven. What does that mean for you and me? Well, first of all, Jesus said this. He said, don't, when it regards the kingdom, don't say. Look over there. There it is. Look over there. There it is. I heard it's over in Israel. Nope. He said, the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is within you. The king, can, can you get a hold of it? The kingdom of heaven is in you, if, you have, if, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've said, come, make your, make your home in me. The Bible says that we are now temples, tabernacles, a home place 
of the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is now within you, which means all of the resources of the kingdom of heaven is there. Which means that whatever God has decreed, whatever the word has spoken in heaven that is forever settled is now in your born again spirit and is forever settled there. That means, that means this. It means that, that you're, you were a sinner, but you're saved by grace. You've become a new creation in Christ Jesus, and now he has forever forgiven you and removed your sin as far as the east is from the west, and now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, but I don't feel very righteous, and I didn't do some righteous things this, way, this week. Well, here's the question. Are you going to believe the word that has forever been settled in heaven, which now lives on the inside of you? Are you going to believe that and engage with that word with your heart? Because at that point, the Bible says, out of your heart flow the issues of life. Out of your heart flow the issues of life. See, when your heart will engage with what God has decreed, Mm. Come on. When your heart, when you say, I'm going to believe and I'm going to let my life be governed yeah. Yeah. by the word right. that has been decreed and settled in heaven and which resides right now on my, in my born again spirit, what happens is, is, is your, your heart opens up and the resources and the flow of grace and the flow of righteousness and the flow of that word and the, and the results of it works. It comes from your heart and it begins to affect the way you think. It begins to affect what you say. It begins to affect how you live. You start living the changed life. Amen. That's the way you engage with the word of God. But if I don't know what's in the word, hmm. Then how am I going to engage my heart with it? See, I can believe that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. But I know a lot of people that sing that song. But man, they're still just experiencing the same misery that everybody else. Why would the Bible say that He has made us more than a conqueror? Why would the Bible tell us that now thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph? Why would the word of God say, now thanks be unto God who always gives me the victory? Why would the word of God tell me all those things? Why would the word of God say, as he is, so are we in this world if we're supposed to live just like everybody else? Jesus said, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. And get it, he redeemed us from the power of darkness. He moved us from the power of Satan. And so now he says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to make all things new. Mm. Praise God. Let's look at this parable a little closer in Matthew chapter 13. Let's just start in verse 1. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. And I just love this. Let's not just read through it. Let's get a picture of this. The same day, Jesus went out of his house and he sat by the seaside. I mean, I just love that picture. Just on a great, beautiful day like today, he went out of the house, sat down by the seaside right there by the beach. And uh, just, just the, the humanity of Jesus, of that living word in the flesh. And, and the next verse and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat. So, I mean, if you get the picture, here he goes. He just comes out. He sits by the seaside. And, and then all of a sudden, all these people come. Why? Because they want to hear the word. They want to hear his teaching. They, they, want, to, they want to connect with the one that's performing miracles and signs and wonders. And, and, and he's that loving and that compassionate uh, to the point there were so many that he had to get into a ship and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So you get that picture of him just kind of sitting there in the, in the bow of the boat there as he's just teaching them. 
concerning things of the kingdom that he has been declaring. He spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. In other words, he's talking about a farmer. A farmer went out to sow some seed, to plant a garden. And when he sowed, when he was throwing that seed, some of the seeds fell by the wayside. And so the fowls came and they devoured them up. So he's just giving a mental picture. I bet Jesus was an amazing storyteller. Can you imagine him just painting that picture? Some fell on stony or rocky ground where they didn't have much earth and immediately it sprung up because there wasn't much deepness of earth. And, and, and you start seeing the parallels. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they did not have enough root, they withered away. And then the next verse says, And some fell among thorns. And the thorns, they sprung up. And they choked it. They choked the seed that the farmer was planting. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Some... A hundred, some sixty-fold, some thirty-fold. So the seed produced when it went into good ground. And so verse 9, he says this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, uh, now, now pay attention to this. He who has ears to hear. Now they had just heard with their natural ears. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about hearing with your heart. He's talking about hearing with your spirit ears. Now get a hold of this. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I wrote it this way. Set your heart. We're talking about living the changed life. Letting my life be governed by the word of God that has been forever settled in heaven. Now, I want my life, my thinking to be governed by that word. Set your heart, set your affections to hear and to understand the word of God. Make the decision to let your life be governed by the word. It's a good place to say amen. 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 So look at verse 10. So here he had just finished saying this to the crowds and he is done with his message. He didn't explain his message. He didn't explain the story to them. I want you to get a hold of this. The disciples came and said unto him, why do you speak to them in parables? Now, get a hold of this. This is, this is a great question. This would be like me telling a story. This would be like David getting up and telling a story and not explaining what the story meant. This would be like me telling you a story and just leaving it there and saying, you are dismissed. See you later. Somebody's going to come to me and say, uh, why didn't you explain the story? Why didn't you? So this is what the disciples are asking. Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it's not given to them. What? That seems awfully, um, oh, what's the word? Respecter of persons. Seems awfully you know, restrictive. Um, you know, you, you're special, but they're not. You know, kind of thing. It's kind of exclusive in that sense. Like, yeah, you, you, it's given. So I want to know why were the disciples, why was it given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it was not given to the rest of the crowds to understand this parable? There's a, there's a reason why. There's a difference between attending a meeting and being a disciple. There's a difference between just coming to an event to listen to a message and deciding that I'm going to live my life governed by the word of the kingdom. Remember what he said uh, concerning um, 
uh, them. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let them hear, let them hear. What, did the, what, what, what was the difference between the disciples and the crowds? The disciples had left everything to follow him. They left their job, their fishing business wasn't as important as following after the one who could make them fishers of men. Sitting there collecting taxes because the government wanted you to wasn't as important as when the master, when the living word said, follow me, Matthew gets up from his table and begins to leave all and to follow the living word of God. They had made a decision in their life because, see, Andrew... And, 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 and Peter, but, but, but Andrew and, and some of them had also been followers of John the Baptist. And they came to Peter and they came to others and said, listen, John the Baptist is telling us that this man has the words of life. Really? Well, we certainly want to experience that and what they do so that they could receive it, so that they could understand it. They said, I'm leaving everything so that I can take a hold of the word of life. The word that's going to produce life in me. I'm going to, I want my life to be governed. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be just somebody that just shows up on a Sunday morning or just two or three times a month and just say, you know what? I got my spiritual, I did my spiritual duty. I got my spiritual, you know, I, I, I checked my, my spiritual list. This is what I'm supposed to do. No, 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 no. They had decided that they were going to be governed by the word, the living word, follow after Jesus, full of grace and truth. And because of that, they put themselves in a position to understand and to learn about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus goes on to say, for whosoever has, verse 12. So here he is, he's answering their question. For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. He's still talking about understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He's still, he's still talking about living your life according to the word of God. But to whosoever has not, in other words, the kingdom's not a priority. The kingdom's not important. I'm not going to hold on and guard the things that I've learned and I'm not going to allow Jesus to manifest in my life. He says, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. See, the, your, your uh, uh, how do I say it? The quality of your life in the kingdom of God. I know we like to talk about we're sons of God. We're daughters of God. We're children of the most high God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. All of that is true. That is your spiritual reality. That is the word that has been forever settled in heaven concerning you. But if you want to move it from the spirit realm and experience it in your emotions, experience it so you're not dealing with depression, experience the joy of the Lord, experience his success in your life, experience his leading and his guiding, experience his blessing, experience every part of the fruit of the spirit and everything that has been offered to you in the kingdom, then you must do what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek First, the kingdom of God. Let your life be governed by the kingdom and the word of that kingdom. And his righteousness. Not your righteousness, his righteousness. Because it's not about what you do. See, life for us, I, I, I'm so thankful for my, my parents. Mom and dad raised me to put the word first place. Raise me to say, I don't care what happens, we're going to, our lives are going to be governed by the word of God. And we had to make some difficult decisions at times. Do we do this or do we do what the word of God says? And every time it comes down to, we're going to obey, we're going to listen to the word of God. And because of that, because of that mindset, as Jennifer and I began to do life together, and have children, and have challenges. We had challenges. We had, everybody's gone through different things. We, 
you know, whatever it is. It doesn't make no difference. We made a decision. Our life is going to be governed by the Word of God. And in 2011, when I still didn't, I, I mean, I did everything that I knew to do from the integrity of my heart, but I still, there were things that I didn't understand. And I came across, or Jennifer came across, Andrew Womack on television, and he was talking about, you've already got it. And she says, Mark, is this true? He says, we've already got everything we're praying for. And I listened to him, and I said, that ain't true, because I'm still trying to get it. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's been smoking, but he does live in Colorado. <laughs> but as we as we begin to listen to it, because, uh, you know, I, 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 it piqued my curiosity. He, he, he was going through the Word. And so for me, it wasn't receiving this, this understanding of grace and what God has already provided for us. It wasn't because it felt good. It wasn't because it was a good idea. It wasn't because it's the new wave that's going through the Christian community. It wasn't because of any of those things. I'd made up my mind a long time ago that, I, that even if I sat here and, and, and was listening to somebody preach or went to a meeting, big famous preacher, that if I didn't, if I didn't see it in the Word, I'd made an independent... Listen, get, get a hold of this. Your life needs to be governed by the Word, not by Facebook. Your life needs, needs to be governed by the Word, not by TV preachers. There's a lot of good preachers out there. But just because somebody that has a worldwide ministry says it, don't mean it's absolutely true. You need to make an independent, individual decision in your life that I'm going, to, I'm going to let my life be governed by the Word of God. I did that in my early 20s. And so because of my independence, see, we have too much groupthink going on in our nation today and going on in the world. Well, because they believe that, I need to do that. Or maybe they're right. Uh-uh, uh-uh, stop that. The majority's not always right. Most of the time, they're wrong. And particularly when it comes to the things of God. You better, you better line up with what the Word of God says because it's the only way. It's a new and living way. Now listen to me. The Bible said, you know, Jesus talked about narrow is the gate, you know, and, 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 and constricted is the way that leads to life. Don't misunderstand what he's saying here. He's not saying that, you know, because now because we get terms, we got to walk the straight and narrow. Got, you've heard that term? He didn't say that. It's not what, he didn't say that the way that we walk our life is straight and narrow. He said the gate, the gate that le the gate that open, get a hold of it. See, our religion has messed this thing up. It's put it all back on us. It's saying that I got to do it a particular way, and if I if I if I if I make one step wrong, then the the, the boogeyman, the devil's going to get me. Yeah. You totally missed the whole point of what the, the gate, the gate. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. But guess what? When I step through that door, when I walk through that gate, I've just opened into an unlimited field of the kingdom of God, of the life of God, of his blessing, and I get to play in the field of his amazing grace for the rest of my life. Woo! So life becomes this amazing. I accept the invitation. He says, come on into my kingdom and enjoy life like you could never experience. Let your life be governed by my word so that you'll experience everything that I have. It's not about what you do, but it's about yielding now to the things of God and saying, since you've created in me a new nature, I'm going to live out of that new nature. I'm going to let Jesus live through me. I'm going to let him live through his life, uh, his life through me, and it's going to be awesome. Mm. And so... And, and so when, when I started watching Andrew Womack and he started talking about the grace of God and the balance between faith and grace, man, he was preaching the word. He was going through scriptures. 
So I didn't believe it because some TV minister said it. He's not easy to listen to sometimes. No, no, no. My life is governed by the Word. And when I saw it in the Word and started seeing Jesus in the Word and beholding what He had said about me, what He had decreed about me, what had been forever settled in heaven about me, and that I could live life this way. And I said, you know what? We're going to live life this way. Everything began to shift. Everything began to change. We began to discover a God that was so good that he just wanted to, to, to be involved in every aspect of our life. We started experiencing hearing his voice to a level that we never thought was possible. It is amazing to me how accurate and how detailed the voice of God can be in a person's life. I was, I was praying here just to give you an example as I bring, start bringing this to a close. Uh, two months ago, two months ago, and there, uh, there was somebody here in the church, so I was here, corporate prayer on a Saturday morning, two months ago, and, and, and man, the Lord dropped in my spirit about this person in the church that had been trying to discover purpose, trying to discover, you know, God, what are you calling me to do at this moment, at this season in my life? The Lord brought, put, brought, put him on my heart and I heard two months. I heard two months. I'm like, man, was that me or the pizza that I ate last night? I mean, that's, I, I, I've never heard that about anybody. And I heard two months. I kept praying about it just there, two months. So I just, I just texted him. I said, brother, I said, I'm praying. And all of a sudden the Lord brought you up in my, in my spirit and said two months. I said, I don't know what that means. I have no idea. I'm just telling you what the Lord said. And I said, but I can tell you this. There's a hope and an expectancy that's attached to it. That's all I know. And I said, put it on the shelf. Do with it what you want. I, I don't know what else to tell you. So this past week, the Lord put on my heart to sit down and talk with him. And, and so we got together. I said, what's the Lord been talking to you about? This was on Wednesday. So what's the Lord been talking to you about? I, I, I said, I know in my spirit. I said, I know that he's been talking to you about something. He said, just this morning, just this morning, the Lord just, just birthed a new purpose and where I'm supposed to be in this season of my life. This, and he began to talk to me about it. As he's talking to me about it, the Holy Ghost was all over it, the Spirit of God. I'm like, dude, this is the Spirit of God. This is, this is it. This is why, this is, you know, it, he's just waiting. This is the time for it. And we talked through those things. And then the Lord quickened to me. I said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I scrolled back through my text messages. Exactly two, exactly two months ago was when the Lord gave me that word for him. Just a, it's, it's just a confirmation this is of me. But man, to be able to hear that clearly from God and to live that kind of life, why is that? Because I've made a decision for my life to be governed by the Word. You know, Jesus said this in John chapter 8. I'm just going to pull it up on the screen. This will be the last scripture and then we'll pick up next week. Living the changed life. Somebody say that with me. Living the changed life. In John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to those Jews. Now look at this. This is very interesting. To those Jews which believed on him. He had just talked to a whole crowd. The crowd represents the same people that were sitting there, standing there on the, on the shore before, right? Here he's talking to a crowd in the temple, and then some of the ones that was listening believed on him. So now he's got instruction, listen to me, he's got instruction to those that believed on him. This wasn't for the rest of the crowd, all right? So he says to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue... In my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So, here's my question this morning to you. Are you one of the crowd? Are you simply one who 
believes and you're going to heaven when you die and that's good, for, good enough for you and you'll show up to church every now and then and that's good enough for you or are you a disciple? You can be a son, you can be a child and never be a disciple. See, sonship doesn't automatically make you a disciple. That's, that's what you decide to do. God didn't... When you got born again, what Jesus did not do is make you a disciple. What he made you was a son. But whether or not you're going to be a disciple and continue in his word and allow the word of God to govern your life, and these are the things we're going to talk about next week, is up to you. That's why Jesus told the disciples, go out into all the world and make disciples of all men. And so what you find is as soon as they got born again, they started spending every day listening to the word, listening to the apostles' doctrine, getting teach. They decided that they were going to be governed by the word of God, that they were going to be governed by the life of Jesus, that they were going to be governed by the word of the kingdom and allow and, and live life in the kingdom, live the changed life, experience the kingdom life instead of just waiting till you got to heaven. It is heaven that came down, that's now on the inside, that I get to engage with my heart, believe with my heart, and allow it to be manifest in my life. And his dominion will reign in my life. Romans 5, 17 says that, we that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign. Somebody say reign. Somebody say rule. Somebody say have dominion. So are you a, one of the crowd? Are you just a believer? Or are you a disciple? And then he says this. You'll be my disciples indeed. And the next verse says, after becoming a disciple, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You don't make yourself free. You can't do enough to get yourself free. But man, when you come into a revelation of the knowledge of the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ and who he's created and what he's decreed and you say, yes, I'm going to live my life according to that truth. I'm going to live my life according to the word of the king that has been forever settled in heaven, that that's what it's going to be, that that just engaging that will produce freedom in your life. You'll begin to live the changed life. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you that for such a time as this, for such a time as, as where we are in your timeline, from ages past to ages now, that we were born into this time not to just live life for ourselves but to manifest your character to manifest your nature and to manifest your kingdom that as we live life with an understanding that what you have decreed that what you have decreed that your word what you have said about each and every one of us, that your word is forever settled in heaven. Father, I pray this morning, every person under, under the sound of my voice will make a decision to let your word forever be settled in their life. And that as your kingdom begins to reign, King Jesus, as you begin to rule, as we begin to look to your word concerning our finances, concerning our bodies, concerning our, our families, concerning our, uh, 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 our jobs, concerning our other relationships, concerning things that have bothered us, things that we have tried to fix on our own, that we come to a place 
that we say no more. No more. I'll stop trying to do it my way. I'll stop trying to fix my situation. I'm going to step back, move out of the way. I'm going to agree with what you have declared and decreed in your word. And Jesus, I'm going to allow you and your finished work to operate in my life. That which has already been decreed, I now make a decision in my heart to live my life that according to that. To release the resources of the kingdom of heaven into this earthly, natural sphere into my immediate life, but to have an effect outside of my life. Dominion restored. Make a decision right now. Let's take some time. Just personally, make a decision right now. Realign. Realign. Prioritize the kingdom of God. It's not about what you do, but it's about a discovery. You discover who you are. You discover who God is. You discover what has been freely given to you. You discover, and, and you will only, uh, the grace of God and everything that he has fully provided for us will only be experienced as faith is mixed with the word. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says that the children of Israel did not mix faith with the word. They didn't believe what was spoken, what had been decreed, what had been forever settled in heaven. And so it didn't profit them. Well, grace has been fully provided. God's love, God's righteousness, everything. He loves you unconditionally. All of that, your sin removed. But none of what God has freely provided to you will be experienced if it's not believed. If it's not just, we're saved by grace through faith. By faith, the Bible says we have access into the grace of God. We have access to his promises. We have access to his goodness. We have access to his kingdom. It's through, it's through believing. So I'm saying engage with your heart. Say, you know what? I'm not just interested in just trying to, trying to believe here for one area of my life. Jesus, I want all of the kingdom operating in every area. I want you ruling. That's it. It's really submission to his rule and his reign in your life, the living word of God. I want you, Jesus, to rule in my life. So I yield to you. I yield to the word. I yield to what was spoken. I yield to those things and I, I choose to believe and let my life be governed by that now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And yes, the Holy Spirit. I hear the, I hear the Father say, the Holy Spirit, He will guide you. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into what you need to know. He will guide you into His Word. He will reveal and make, of, uh, and make, make, uh, make of understanding to you what His Word is saying. You, it's not difficult. It's not hard. Uh, here's a simple rule. Don't be, the Bible says, don't be moved away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. You look to him. You look to him in his word. You look to what he has decreed and allow the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. That's a promise to, to those that will seek after him. Let the Holy Spirit, he'll lead you. He'll guide you into, into every truth that you need for every area. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Father, we thank you for that right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.